Welcome to the Palestine Podcast, produced by the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Benjamin Netanyahu has announced that two weeks from now, Israel would annex parts of the West Bank. Annexation was a key pledge made by Netanyahu during his election campaigns. In April last year, Netanyahu said he would annex Israeli settlements, and in September, he said that he intends to annex the Jordan Valley as well. Such move, which is happening in close coordination with the Trump administration, is seen as implementing part of Donald Trump's Middle East plan or agenda, to be more accurate. However, there is still uncertainty around how, when, or even if Netanyahu would move forward with the annexation plan. It's also not clear which parts of the land would be annexed. But regardless of these details, the goal of this policy lab is to put forward a more nuanced and historical understanding of annexation in terms of what it actually means, its historical and ideological roots, and its political and potential ramifications on the ground. And so we're very happy to have with us today Yara Hawari and Rania Muharab. Yara Hawari is the Senior Policy Fellow of Al Shabaka in Palestine, and Rania is a legal researcher and advocacy officer with the Palestinian human rights organization Al Haq. And I am Noor Arafah. I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford, and I will be facilitating today's policy lab. And I'm going to start with Yara and ask you a very basic uh, question. What do we actually mean uh, by annexation, uh, practically speaking? And what are its historical and ideological roots? Hi, Noor, and uh, thanks to everyone watching us uh, today. Uh, I think it's a very uh, pertinent start to the policy lab. Annexation is sort of this buzzword at the moment that's been flying around and has been the subject of many many webinars and many lectures and, and, and articles. Um, annexation itself is very much an international law term and it refers to when an occupying power extends its sovereignty over an occupied territory. And, and Rania will go into this um, in, in much more depth um, shortly as the legal expert. But I think it's also important to unpack what annexation actually means in sort of more uh, on the ground terms. Generally speaking, I think we can say that annexation is the theft of land, the total control over it uh, and its resources, and usually uh, the, the dispa displacement of uh, indigenous populations. And in Palestine, this initially happened in 1948 with the foundation uh, of the settler colonial state of Israel, and then later with the occupation of the 1967 territories, i.e. the West Bank, Gaza, uh, and the Syrian Golan. International law only really considered the latter um, as illegal, illegally occupied. It recognized the, the foundation of the State of Israel in 1948. Um, uh, and, and the 1967 territories um, are currently uh, what we might call de facto annexed. But I will, again, uh, I think that brings me on to this important point about de facto versus de jure annexation. So many Palestinians will actually tell you uh, that the 1967 territories are already de facto annexed. In other words, Israel has really effective sovereignty over these areas and they control everything from the import of goods, how much water Palestinians can use, uh, the movement of people. Even the Palestinian Authority president, um, Abbas, has to ask for permission from the Israelis when he leaves Ramallah. Um, now, in contrast, de jure annexation is, is referring to the official application of sovereignty um, within Israeli domestic law. Now, for a lot, a lot of Palestinians who live the reality of this, um, it really is legal semantics. You know, Israel essentially controls and has applied sovereignty over uh, all of the territory of what was once Palestine from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and, and this point about de facto versus de jure is a point that really the international community holds on to for dear life. They can accept de facto annexation, but de jure annexation makes it very real for them and something that they then have to contend with. Whilst for Palestinians, actually, the reality of de facto annexation is horrifically violent and, and really very real. Um, another point is what we're actually talking about um, especially from a, a, a Palestinian perspective, is, is an ongoing process of settler colonialism, something 
uh, which in Arabic we call Nakba al Mustamirra, the, the, the continuous Nakba of 1948. Um, and in Palestine, this began um, when Zionists began uh, settling uh, the land in, uh, before 1948. And it was institutionalized in 1948 with the establishment of Israel as a Jewish state. And it's continued to expand onto Palestinian land through different mechanisms of, of theft. And it's tried to subdue and dominate the indigenous population through various different mechanisms, including a, a system of apartheid which may I remind everyone, it's not just about separation of people, but rather it uses a separation to enshrine economic and social dominance of one group over another. And, and rather ironically, South African apartheid was also enshrined in 1948. So I would say that annexation has to be understood as the control of land and the displacement of indigenous people in the case of Palestine. Um, and importantly, that it's always been on the cards and it was actually uh, the raison d'etre when, when Israel was established uh, by the Zionist founding fathers in 1948. Yeah, thank you, Yara. Um, so, Rania, can you give us your legal perspective and tell us more about the legal historical um, perspective on, uh, on annexation? Absolutely. Thanks, Noor and Yara, also for the introductions. I think that really set the scene of what we're talking about when we're talking about annexation, but also on the legal level, uh, in terms of when we consider the Nakba and we consider the policies that have targeted the Palestinian people for the past 70 years, um, these two have been breaches of international law. So we're, when we talk about the illegality of annexation, uh, we're not talking about something that started in 1967, but we're talking about a principle enshrined in international law prior to the Nakba already. So already in the 1940s, 1945 specifically, the UN Charter enshrined the prohibition on the acquisition of territory by force, and in particular, the prohibition on the use of force in international relations. And that principle was well enshrined as a cardinal principle of international law already before the Nakba, which I think is really important for us to recall here, especially in light of the introduction that Yara just gave. So it's important to say that annexation was already something that was prohibited under international law in 1948. It was prohibited in 1967 and it still is prohibited today. Um, the only reason it continues to occur is because Israel enjoys widespread and institutionalized impunity that allows for these policies to continue to be perpetuated despite the illegality under international law. But if we want to go back more to the historical roots, I think that it's important to bring this up because not only was annexation illegal, but also the partition of Palestine in 1947 was illegal because it violated the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination and sovereignty, a right that already then had been recognized provisionally by the League of Nations. And therefore, it, the annexation and acquisition of territory by force in 1948 and thereafter violated sacrosanct principles of international law that grant Palestinians the right to permanent sovereignty over their natural wealth and resources, and that includes land, obviously. So this is the basis upon which we're talking about. The other point that is important to recall is that annexation is not unprecedented in the Palestinian context. Annexation has been happening since 1948. Um, and I'll give one example uh, with, for example, the annexation of, East, uh, of West Jerusalem in 1948. In August 1948, Israel declared that Jerusalem was, quote-unquote, Israel-occupied territory, and it imposed a military rule on Jerusalem. That followed, obviously, widespread and systematic massacres of Palestinian civilians during the Nakba, and the dispossession and displacement of 60,000 Palestinians, at least from West Jerusalem, who became refugees and have been denied their right of return ever since. Um, and in that context, Israel annexed, occupied, and then later annexed um, the territory of West Jerusalem, a territory which was supposed to be, according to the partition plan at least, internationalized. But even so, the partition plan violated Palestinian self-determination. And then a year later, in 1949, during discussions at the UN on Israeli membership within the UN, um, one of the representatives spoke about the territories that had been allotted to an Arab state and said that Israel had not only annexed Arab territory, but also annexed what they considered at the time to be international or UN territory, such as the UN, having annexed, for example, the Western Galilee, Jaffa, Lid, and Ramle, but also parts of Jerusalem, which had been regarded as 
um, as having a special status under international law. And to this day, Israeli sovereignty is not recognized in this territory that was annexed in 1948, in particular West Jerusalem, but also in East Jerusalem, which was annexed in 1967 and has been annexed ever since. And that's why, for example, the relocation of embassies to Jerusalem is illegal and uh, no recognition of Israeli sovereignty is permitted in the city. Uh, these are the results, the legal results and ramifications of, of annexation, which is considered illegal under international law. And that brings me to my last point, which is the reason these policies continue to perpetuate to be perpetuated is the fact of Israeli impunity and the fact that the international community, while not recognizing annexation as legal, have never taken any steps to reverse facts on the ground, to reverse the existence of annexation um, in the context of Palestine. And then, of course, um, not to take measures to bring that illegal situation to an end. I also recall that the Syrian Golan, the occupied Syrian Golan, is annexed by Israel since 1967. In the case of the Golan, uh, the international community failed as well to adopt sanctions to reverse that illegal annexation. Um, and we are seeing today the ramifications of that, which is continued displacement and dispossession of Palestinians, transfer of Palestinians from their lands, the transfer, illegal transfer of Israeli settlers into the occupied territory, uh, the occupied Palestinian territory, but also the occupied Syrian Golan. Um, and in turn, uh, the, the changes to the demographic character and composition of that territory, which are violations of international law, and they contribute to that erasure of Palestinians, which is a systematic policy since the Nakba. Thank you, Yanya. Yara, there have been oppositions to annexation by the settler movement and even within the Netanyahu Gantz uh, government. Can you tell us more how Israeli politics are shaping the annexation plan and um, what Israel can uh, do in the future? Yeah, for sure. And I think it's very important to contextualize uh, uh, Israeli uh, domestic politics um, over the last year um, uh, when we're looking at annexation. This last year has seen incredibly dramatic goings on uh, with three elections uh, within a year um, as a result of both uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and his rival Benny Gantz unable to, to even gather uh, together a sort of a majority to form a government. Uh, now, throughout this, this period, this election period, annexation was actually discussed by both sides as a given. The Gantz team even claimed at one point that Netanyahu had actually plagiarized the idea uh, from them. Uh, and may I remind you all that, that Benny Gantz was um, sort of uh, put forward by uh, Israeli uh, lefty uh, sort of uh, liberal outlets and the international community as a, you know, as a, as a political alternative to Netanyahu. Now, eventually, the, uh, an emergency unity government was agreed upon um, between Netanyahu and Gantz, um, with Netanyahu continuing uh, to serve as prime minister for the first 18 months, um, and then Gantz supposedly uh, taking over. But uh, that is yet to be seen, I think. Now, in terms of the, the agreements, an annexation was an, uh, was an agreed upon point at the, at the time of signing. Uh, and it was said that by July 1st, um, it will be uh, proposed to the cabinet and the Knesset. Now, I'll, I'll go back to the importance of this date uh, shortly. But for a lot of liberal Zionists, as I said, they, they really place their hopes in Gantz's blue and white co uh, coalition as an alternative to the corrupt reign of Netanyahu. Um, and, and his deal was actually seen as um, a deal of capitulation and, and collaboration. And a lot of international diplomats have placed their hope in, in Gantz as, as a possible opponent to annexation and as a potential partner uh, for peace. And it's even been reported that European officials um, directly warned Gantz not to enter into a deal uh, which would include annexation. And I really think this was naive and misplaced hope, um, especially considering uh, well, what, when we look at uh, Gantz's rhetoric. I mean, this is a man who used images of indiscriminate bombings in Ga of Gaza in one of his election campaigns. Uh, and as I said earlier, he, he uh, said that the Netanyahu's annexation idea was plagiarized from his political manifesto and that the Jordan Valley would always be an inseparable part of Israel. So really, far from being an alternative to Netanyahu, Gantz is really, really demonstrating that he is a desperate copycat. 
Um, now, something else that the Israeli elections demonstrated very well is that the theft of Palestinian land and illegal settlement building in the West Bank enjoys cross-partisan support. Um, and, and, and the final point that I'd like to, to mention is that Israeli Jewish settlement building in the West Bank has never ceased since the state's um, uh, uh, since the Israeli state's occupation of it in '67, and it was a so-called uh, left-wing Israeli government, a Labour government that spearheaded the settlement enterprise. Um, now, with regards to the, the date of July 1st, it seems like there will be a postponing of, of that. Uh, firstly, because there hasn't been clarity from the U.S. administration, and secondly, because there hasn't been an agreement within the unity government on on the details of annexation itself. So what now seems more likely is is a limited uh, or, or a partial annexation that will happen in stages. And I think, to be honest, this is equally as dangerous, if not more dangerous, because there will be less of an international outcry, even though uh, now uh, the outcry is limited at best. Mm -hmm. So um, so speaking of this, um, it's like a phased approach uh, to annexation that the Israeli government um, is actually uh, carrying out. So Irania, what would be uh, the legal uh, ramifications of, uh, of such an approach? Absolutely. Um, thanks, Nur, for that. If, if I may start with the following, which is the legal ramifications of annexation, we already know what they are because it's not the first time that Israel annexes territory in violation of international law. And therefore, since we're not dealing with an unprecedented situation, it is important to understand annexation within the wider context uh, in which it, is be, it, which it is taking place and in which it occurs. And in the context of Palestine, Yara has already mentioned this um, initially, this is happening in a context of apartheid. Um, now, a lot of commentators over the past few months in particular have talked about annexation creating a situation or a reality of apartheid over the Palestinian people. But that, in fact, is not very accurate because it suggests that apartheid would only be created by annexation. This, for us, we know is not true because apartheid already exists and is institutionalized on the ground. I think it suffices to look at the definition of apartheid under international law, which is enshrined as a crime against humanity in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, and is defined as a system or a regime of institutionalized racial oppression and domination by one racial group over any other racial group or groups and committed with the intention of maintaining that regime. So this is the definition according to the Rome Statute of the crime of apartheid. And it tells us that for apartheid to exist, there needs to be an institutionalized system that imposes apartheid through laws, policies, and practices. And that is exactly what we have in place. But it is, but it's not something that is, that, is, that is coming to fruition right now with annexation. It is something that has already existed decades ago and that in fact is founded in the institutional and legal foundations of the State of Israel as they were put in place in the immediate aftermath of the Nakba. I think here it's important, I, I would like to just outline a few specific uh, Israeli laws that really entrench this racial discrimination on the ground um, and that really will inform any further annexation, but also um, control over the Palestinian people and the subjugation of the Palestinian people. So if we start uh, start off, we need to just recall two things. One is that apartheid is institutionalized in Israeli laws, but also it is perpetuated by Zionist institutions that play a quasi-governmental role and that are chartered to discriminate against Palestinians. Of the laws that we are particularly talking about, we have the 1950 Law of Return, which allows and gives the exclusive right to any um, any any person to enter Israel as a Jewish immigrant, any Jewish person, I should say. In contrast, Palestinian refugees are not granted that right of return. And if we look at um, 1948 and 1967, Palestinian refugees from both wars were never allowed their right of return. And this is a systematic policy. And in particular, the Jordan Valley is a very is a place where this is very stark because the Jordan Valley had a, and Area C in general. Um, had about 200,000 Palestinians in uh, 1967. Today, we are talking about about 50,000 Palestinians who live in the area. So I don't think that there's any other part of the world where you can see such a dramatic uh, re uh, uh, reduction in the population. And a lot of it is due to the fact that 
First of all, Palestinian refugees were never allowed to return. And second of all, policies continue to displace and uproot Palestinians on the ground. Um, the second uh, law that I'd like to talk about is the citizenship, Israeli citizenship law of 1952, because that law essentially cements Israeli institutionalized racism in law because it confers to any Jewish person who comes to Israel the exclusive right to obtain citizenship. And Palestinians, of course, are denied that very right. And it is distinct from nationality because, in fact, Israel's citizenship law recognizes quote-unquote return as only one pathway to Israeli citizenship, which also includes birth, marriage, and residency. At the same time, Jewish nationality does not confer, uh, is, is only conferred upon Jewish persons, and therefore citizenship is not the basis for equal rights. This has been the case for the past seven decades. It is not something that is materializing today. And finally, also on citizenship and entry, the 1952 Entry into Israel law, on the one hand, grants preferential treatment to Jewish immigrants under the law of return, but at the same time, it grants a, pre it, it grants a precarious permanent residency status on Palestinians who are residents of East Jerusalem, whose status can be revoked at any time, as we know very well. And in fact, since 67, about 14,500 Palestinians with East Jerusalem residency have seen that permanent, so-called permanent residency, revoked and their right to live in Jerusalem uh, taken away from them. A second set of laws that are really important here and that will have bearing on the annexation are, is the question of access and rights to land and property. Um, because, uh, because, for example, we have um, a key element of dispossession in Israeli law is the 1950 absentee property law, which was used in the immediate aftermath of the Nakba to seal the dispossession of Palestinian refugees and to confiscate their, their property by the state on the basis that they were absent, even though they were denied return and never allowed to come back to their homes and property. And then at the same time, this law is still used today in East Jerusalem, for example, which is an ex-territory, and it's being used to further dispossess Palestinians in the city. This is something that we can see further on with further annexation and application of Israeli law to the Jordan Valley or the rest of the occupied West Bank. And finally, a last piece of legislation that I think is really important to highlight is the 2018 Jewish nation state basic law, which essentially entrenched this institutionalized racial discrimination in Israeli laws and gave it this constitutional legal foundation, and therefore it informs all other laws in the country. And it stipulates on the one hand that there's an exclusive right of self-determination in Israel unique to the Jewish people, and at the same time the Jewish settlement is a national value, even though settlement construction and expansion violates the, violates the prohibition on population transfer. And, and therefore, what it does is it entrenches um, Israeli settlement expansion in the occupied territory, but it also entrenches racial segregation against Palestinians who are citizens. And therefore, this is happening on both sides of the green line. A final point that I think is really important to mention, and I uh, talked about this earlier, is the role of Zionist institutions in this process of oppression and domination over Palestinians. Because Zionist parastatal institutions are granted under Israeli law uh, the status of quasi-governmental entities. And in fact, they are chartered to discriminate materially against non-Jewish persons, and they have historically prevented Palestinians on both sides of the Green Line from accessing and exercising control over their natural resources, including land, um, and thereby exploiting and diverting Palestinian resources for the benefit of Israeli uh, Jewish settlers. And finally, Israel defers to these institutions in all matters of legislation and policy, which affects development, commerce, agriculture, access to and control over land and resources, um, and urban planning, as well as other civil matters. So overall, what we're saying here is that Israel's institutionalized discrimination over the Palestinian people, and that really includes all Palestinians on both sides of the Green Line and as refugees and exiles abroad, is entrenched in Israeli laws and has been so entrenched for the past seven decades. And therefore, further annexation is only a materialization and a crystallization of this process of apartheid that has systematically deprived the Palestinian people of exercising their inalienable rights. 
Thank you, uh, Rania. I just want to remind the audience that in five, ten minutes from now, we will be taking your questions. So please feel free to ask your questions or there is like in the bar um, uh, questions or like vote because I will be um, asking the questions with the highest number of votes. We also have a policy lab uh, poll. So please uh, take it to let us know what topics you would like us to uh, consider uh, for uh, future policy labs. Um, Yara, so Rania talked about the um, annexation perpetuating the reality of apartheid that we are already living. And you talked about Palestinians living an ongoing uh, Nakba. Um, what do you think are the other uh, implications of annexations on the ground besides the legal implications that uh, Rania uh, pointed out to? Thank you, Noor. Uh, before, I'm, before I talk about those ramifications, I think it's important to, to mention the responses of the international um, uh, community since uh, uh, the unity government's declared annexation position. Um, there were several uh, EU member states that have made comments about this and ha have, have warned and strongly advised Israel against annexation. Um, Germany has stated that it's worried about annexations, but uh, confirmed that, that Israel won't be facing sanctions. Um, and, and as Rania mentioned earlier, you know, there are really little consequences when uh, Israel annexed Jerusalem in 1980, when annexed Syrian Golan also in the 80s. Really barely caused a whisper among the, the international community, apart from this pattern of lukewarm uh, 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 condemnations. Uh, and that's really, uh, I think, important, important to highlight. Now, for, for many Palestinians, and actually, annexation doesn't really bring anything new. Um, it, it will annex accelerate the loss of land, the, the displacement of people. But I, I, I think that's for certain. But as I mentioned before, and as you highlighted, this is really a continuing process. Now, what it, in terms of what it looks like on the ground, it, it means a, a further cementing, uh, I think, of the bastardization of areas A, which are these small ghettos of highly density uh, populated Palestinian urban areas, which are supposedly under um, some type of uh, Palestinian authority uh, autonomy, uh, where access between these uh, ghettos or these bantustans is controlled by uh, the Israeli regime. Um, there is uh, a, a frequent demolition of, of Palestinian homes outside of area, of area A. Um, and of course, um, it, this uh, annexation looks like it will lead to uh, the complete theft of area C as a, as a first step. Now, as I talk about these areas A, B, and C, I think it's important to remind ourselves that this division of land was created by the Oslo Accords in a supposed attempt to get to uh, Palestinian statehood, like a staggered um, uh, process towards uh, Palestinian sovereignty in the West Bank and Gaza. But what really happened, and, and something that the, the scholar Edward Said had foresight to see when he wrote um, in the London Review of Books, uh, the, the piece the morning after, it laid the foundation for what we see today and it laid the foundation for complete Israeli control from um, the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, as we're looking at the likely annexation of, of the Jordan Valley as a, as a first step, I think it's important to talk about the Jordan Valley. The Jordan Valley is 30% of the West Bank. It's home to um, an estimated 150,000 Palestinians. Um, uh, and it's a very, very fertile strip of land. It runs across uh, uh, the West Bank um, from, from the, uh, uh, the, the West Bank, um, that, uh, uh, that strip of land that borders uh, Jordan. Um, uh, and, and this is an area uh, that has a huge you know, land reserve, and it could be um, an area for, uh, for future development of the West Bank. It could, you know, it has uh, space, um, it has potential for uh, uh, the development of advanced agriculture. Indeed, it has um, very, very ancient history of, of advanced uh, agriculture in that region. Um, there's possibilities to develop, you know, energy product, pro uh, projects and industries. But currently, as it stands, Israel completely exploits almost all of the Jordan Valley. Um, it uses the, the northern part of the Dead Sea for its, for its own needs, and it, it prevents Palestinians 
uh, from using about 85% of the, the area. Um, and actually, because of uh, the significance of the Jordan Valley, the richness, the fertileness of the Jordan Valley, not long after it was uh, occupied in 1967, there was a proposed plan by the Israelis called the Alon Plan, which is not too different to what we see with the, the Trump plan today, which proposes the complete uh, confiscation of the Jordan Valley of the Israeli regime. And it proposed that uh, the West Bank would be divided into two areas and the sovereignty would be handed over to, uh, to, the, to Jordan. Um, so what we're seeing really is a repeat of history, sort of repackaged into all these new ideas that essentially what it means on the ground is the loss of Palestinian land and the displacement of, uh, of Palestinians from their homes. Uh, thank you, uh, Yaira. Um, very briefly, um, let's talk about future actions before we start, because we have many questions from the, the audience. Uh, Rania, uh, Yaira talked about the empty condemnations by the international community, and there is a sense of frustration among Palestinians about uh, the international community simply paying lip service uh, to, to the Palestinians. What do you think is the responsibility of the legal responsibility of states um, in the current uh, situation? Absolutely. Um, and I, I will definitely take it from the last point that you mentioned, which is certainly there is frustration because there are no actions that have ever been taken to hold Israel accountable. And that is since the Nakba until today. No crimes have ever been uh, prosecuted uh, or remedied. And at the same time, these very same crimes continue to be committed today, in particular population transfer, destruction of property, but also the crime of apartheid, which targets the Palestinian people. So I think what, uh, what we're trying to say here is that the first response and the, the most genuine response to annexation should be ensuring international justice and accountability. This is for us a very important, uh, a very important position that we hold as Palestinian civil society, um, but also Palestinian human rights organizations working directly with the International Criminal Court. For us, it's important to say that the International Criminal Court is a court of last resort, and it should be its jurisdiction should be activated in the case of Palestine by opening a full, thorough, and comprehensive ICC investigation into suspected war crimes and crimes against humanity that are being committed in Palestine, as already recognized by the prosecutor of the court. So this is an important recommendation for us, which is um, if we want to put an end to Israeli impunity and ensure that these violations don't continue to happen, then there is an urgent need for justice and accountability, and there's a need also for states to support an ICC investigation, rather than what we have seen in the past few months, which was attempts by a number of third states to undermine that very investigation and pursuit of justice for the Palestinian people. A second thing that is important is to make sure that states are addressing the root causes, because in fact, they don't just have an obligation to um, uh, not to recognize annexation as legal, but they also have responsibilities not to aid and assist in maintaining that situation and to cooperate to bring that illegal situation to an end, which is an important responsibility that states, at least in the context of Palestine, have never taken. Um, in 2019, last year, uh, the UN Commission of Inquiry, for example, um, on the Gaza Strip, uh, recommended that member states of the UN Im consider imposing individual sanctions and travel bans or asset freezes um, on those who are identified as responsible of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Of course, over a year since the adoption of those recommendations by the UN Human Rights Council, um, they have not been implemented, and that follows a pattern of institutionalized impunity, which in fact allows for the perpetuation of Israeli oppression over the Palestinian people. And so the idea is that even if we look at the past 20 years, no recommendations of any UN Commission of Inquiry or fact-finding mission on Palestine has been implemented, and there have been 10 of them um, over the past two decades, um, and yet impunity has still prevailed. Um, another recommendation by the UN Special Rapporteur on, on the situation of human rights in Palestine is that states uh, adopt effective measures such as sanctions um, to ensure that annexation is deterred, and, um, and he has also said that annexation would crystallize a 21st century apartheid. Uh, accountability is also needed on the corporate level, so to ensure that businesses that are implicated in Israeli settlements, um, illegal Israeli settlements, are held to account um, 
and don't continue to profit from that illegal situation. Um, one important avenue to refer to here is the UN database of businesses um, involved uh, or complicit in Israel, Israel settlement enterprise. And so what we are calling for is for that database to be um, to be continually and annually updated so that it can continue to be an active tool for corporate accountability uh, and to ensure that businesses are no longer implicated. Another very important example is what's happening in Ireland today. Ireland is the only country that is taking serious legislative measures to ban trade with illegal Israeli settlements. And by the way, this is an obligation for all states, not only Ireland. And therefore, um, what Ireland is doing is it's setting the stage for further states to really abide, and ab abide by international law and uphold that responsibility to ensure that they don't aid or assist in maintaining the illegal situation. And finally, if we want to talk about bringing the situation to an end, I think it's important to say that um, it needs to start with recognition recognition that annexation does not happen in, in isolation, that it's happening within the context of institutionalized uh, and systematic racial oppression over the Palestinian people, which constitutes apartheid, and therefore recognition of Israeli apartheid as a step towards bringing an end to that illegal situation. And there are a few mechanisms within the UN that can be triggered and that already existed under apartheid in South Africa, such as the UN Center Against Apartheid and the UN Special Committee Against Apartheid, which are effective mechanisms in which civil society can um, can engage and contribute to bringing the illegal situation to an end. Um, and that is a process that uh, states should support um, and should increasingly recognize in order to ensure that impunity um, is brought to an end. Uh, thank you, uh, Rania. Um, Yara, and here we're responding to one of the questions uh, with a high number of votes regarding what can be done. Um, Yara, can you tell us more about what you think should be the role of the PA, if it can ever survive the repercussions of annexation or like civil society organizations, activists? What can be done? Yeah, I think looking at the Palestinian leadership's reaction to, to these latest uh, political developments. Unfortunately, they they have been really repetitive and, and regretfully quite weak. Um, there was an initial threat by uh, the PA president, um, Mahmoud Abbas, to completely cancel all the agreements uh, that was um, initially, uh, uh, and then it was actually uh, then it was actually done uh, not so long ago. And they did what they what everyone thought was unthinkable. And they announced the, the end of all agreements with Israel and the US, including the infamous uh, security coordination uh, between the, the PA um, and the um, Israeli army, which allows for the sharing of information and allows for uh, the Israeli army uh, to, to enter into to areas over the West, of the West Bank whenever they want. Um, but in reality, you know, what we've seen is these these agreements haven't been cut. We've seen a sort of downgrading of the interaction between the PA and COGAT, the Israeli body that um, administers or occupies the West Bank, um, but it hasn't been halted. Um, and, and the Oslo of the division, the Oslo division of the West Bank, is still being respected by the PA, and the PA itself is uh, is a child of the Oslo Accords. So if we, you know, talking with all seriousness about uh, ending uh, the agreements, including Oslo, um, the PA is sort of announcing its own uh, its own end. Um, the PA was uh, is not the Palestinian the representative of the Palestinian people. It's a, it was established as supposedly an interim government. Um, so it's uh, uh, the PA is really, I think, stuck uh, in between a rock and a hard place. Um, now, with regards to sort of wider Palestinian society, I do think there is a problem in that uh, we have been placing too much hope uh, in, the, in the European Union as a potential partner or, or ally for the Palestinian people. And um, I put myself included in, in, in that group. You know, the, the European Union is Israel's largest trading partner. And yet apart from settlement labeling uh, or, or differentiation, which basically all it did was not say that illegal settlement produce wouldn't be allowed in the European market. It said that it would have to be labelled so consumers could make that individual choice and it faced such huge backlash and it, and it took so long to get to that point. Apart from that, there have been really very little uh, uh, consequences for Israel's continuous um, disregard of, of, of international law. 
Uh, and the European Union um, itself is going through all kinds of, uh, of internal issues. But with regards to how it, for it to, you know, take a prominent uh, role in the, in the so-called Middle East peace process, it's really struggling to do so. Um, and this is very well uh, demonstrated by uh, the, the high um, representative of the European Union of Foreign Affairs, uh, Joseph Borrell, in a, in a press conference he gave the other day, when he said that the U.S., Plan, the Trump plan, created momentum for a political process that was stuck for too long. He then goes on to say that this momentum can be used to start uh, joint international efforts. So in essence, he's praising, uh, praising the Trump plan um, and, uh, and not coming out and, and, and speaking uh, uh, firmly and, and solidly about annexation and the fact that actually the Trump plan gives a green light to, to annexation. Now, this is not being defeatist, this is not a defeatist attitude, but it's really to think about who are we calling friends, who are we calling allies, and to hold them accountable for their complicity. Now, just briefly to say um, what Palestinian civil society should do, um, I think it's a very difficult question, but I think first and foremost, they have to hold steadfast and they have to do so collectively. There are so many attempts currently to... to uh, try and divide Palestinian civil society uh, um, with with conditional funding uh, uh, to pit people against each other, um, uh, and so I think it's of uh, super important that Palestinian civil society holds together and also to pursue things that makes the oppression of Palestinians, the theft of Palestinian land costly, such as BDS, but also the ICC, as Radia mentioned, and also the pursuit of um, individual criminal liability cases outside of Israel and Palestine for indi Israeli individuals who are committing uh, and violate, committing crimes and violating international law. And, and finally, most importantly, Palestinians really need to consider uh, cleaning up our own political house. We need to reset, reset our political agenda and, uh, and strategy. And to do this, we need an accountable, a legitimate and a representative leadership, not one that is con uh, consistently capitulating um, uh, and, and this is no easy feat, and it's not, a, it's not something that's a short-term fix at all. Thank you, uh, Yara and um, Yurania, for uh, your insights. Um, this was very um, informative. I, I'm, we're running out of time, so I want to start with the questions uh, immediately. Um, there's a question by Hussein uh, referring to uh, your differentiation, Yara, between de facto and de jure annexation. So he's asking, Yara mentioned the fact that the West Bank has in many ways been already uh, de facto annexed. Practically speaking, what difference will the jury annexation mean for the Palestinians living in the area annexed? I think maybe here I can address this question to Rania, given that he's asking about the jury and its practical implications. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's put it this way. The difference legally between the de facto and the jury annexation is that the jury annexation is when uh, the laws of the occupying power are directly applied in the occupied territory. That is the case in Jerusalem, for example. So the Israeli laws, jurisdiction, administration are applied in this annexed and occupied territory. Um, therefore, the annexation is de jure, meaning it is legal in the laws of that country. But it doesn't mean that it's lawful because, in fact, annexation is not lawful under international law and should not uh, and is not accepted in any case. Um, de facto annexation is a situation that we have had essentially for many decades in the occupied West Bank, where in fact Israel is the occupying power, does not extend its laws and jurisdiction to that occupied territory, but in fact controls every aspect of Palestinians' lives in the territory, controls land and resources, um, as it does throughout the occupied Palestinian territory, also in the Gaza Strip. Um, and, uh, and in doing so, um, it basically has established a situation where de facto it is annexing that territory, even if that recognition is not enshrined in its legislation. So essentially, this is the difference. And having already explained the context that we're talking about, for Palestinians, there will be no difference, whether it's de facto or de jure annexation. This is legal semantics, if you want. The, the, the only difference is that 
um, the international community seems to be taking the jury annexation much more seriously than de facto annexation. But in fact, even that position is not very genuine because, as we know, the jury annexation already exists in Jerusalem and in the occupied Syrian Golan, with no measures taken to reverse that reality. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Yanya. Um, Yara, there's a question from David. He's referring to Gidon Levy, who argues that annexation would be a recognition of the fact of Israeli hegemony in an apartheid state. And he's saying the task now is to design a plan for a working democracy that grants equal civil status to all. Um, that design would allow for linguistic, religious, and cultural uh, pluralism. Is it possible? And this is actually linked to another question we have on one democratic secular state and uh, whether, uh, it's, um, whether it's possible. Um, thank you, Noor. Um, this is actually... Uh, um, something that uh, has not just been argued by Gideon Levy, but by many uh, Palestinians, that that uh, the the impending or uh, de jure annexation will actually serve to mm. to remove this uh, facade um, of uh, air, of two states of any kind of uh, Palestinian sovereignty on the West Bank or any kind of intention of Israel to allow for for a Palestinian state. And as Rania mentioned, you know this isn't. Uh, de jure annexation doesn't mean that we will have an apartheid reality. That apartheid reality already exists. It was established in 1948 um, in, in the 48 territories, and it was then lifted and expanded into the 67 territories. Now, what we're dealing with is a one-state reality, a one-regime reality, which exists from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, um, and that reality is is a is a a regime that controls uh, people based on, on ethnicity and based on the dominance of one group of people over another. And the question that we have in front of us now is what do we want that regime to look like? Do we want it to be uh, a settler colonial regime which uh, uses uh, apartheid as a mechanism to control the indigenous population? Or do we want that regime to be a decolonized one um, that is based on justice, that is based on reparations, um, that is uh, based on equality. Uh, and I think the latter is definitely more in keeping with most people's ideas of morality. But the problem has been the framing of this issue, the framing of Palestine and Israel as two national warring groups, when in reality, as I mentioned, it has, it's a continuous settler colonial project. Now, to say, is it possible? I do think it's possible. I don't think that it's short term. I don't think that it's a short term fix. I don't think that tomorrow uh, we will decolonize uh, this land. I think that this is a long term future vision, but nevertheless, one that we have to pursue for future generations. If uh, you, you, Noor, uh, myself and Rania, if we don't see it, but if we get closer to it for our children, for our grandchildren, for our comrades of the future, then I think it is an important and, uh, and worthwhile cause to pursue. Thank you, um, Yara. Um, Rania, we have a question from Johnny. Um, uh, so, he, saying the legal and human rights perspectives on annexation and on Israel's apartheid policies are clear. But Israel has been successful in presenting all these issues as part of a broader political uh, dispute to be negotiated, while at the same time doing everything it can to make nego negotiations impossible. What do you think the Palestinians can do to bring the debate back to the fundamental human rights and legal issues to force Israel and its supporters to recognize Palestinian uh, rights? I think you're the best person to answer this question given your work with al haq because you, you, uh, you focus a lot on this area. So what do you think can Palestinians do to bring back Palestinian rights uh, to the table? Absolutely. I think that's just a really, really important question, to be honest. And I think my, my answer is we have to defragment in our approach towards Palestinians. This has been one of the biggest tools of apartheid imposed over the Palestinian people has been to fragment and to divide and to conquer Palestinians in a way that makes it look like Palestinians are not one people. 
Palestinians in different areas are treated differently based on a status that is arbitrarily imposed on them by the Israeli state. And therefore, what is happening is that Palestinians are not even being regarded as one people across the Green Line, on both sides of the Green Line, but also Palestinian refugees and exiles are not considered in many of the discussions that are taking place today. And in fact, they should be at the center of that discussion because it is the denial of Palestinian refugee return that entrenches this very fragmentation of Palestinians and that prevents Palestinians from exercising any collective rights. So I think that the response really and this is not just from civil society, but also this is something that states should do, is one where the Palestinian people needs to be regarded as a whole. And if we want to talk about self-determination in a decolonized, uh, decolonized framing that Yara suggests, then we really need to start thinking about the fact that all Palestinians are, are um uh, are facing the same apartheid system, and therefore um, they all are being denied the exercise of their right to self-determination and return to their homes and property. So this is, for me, I think the framing is really important. And I, re I recall here just one more point, which is that in 2017, the UN published a very important report uh, by the Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, uh, which uh, described uh, Israeli policies and practices towards the Palestinian people as a whole, as a system of apartheid. And in doing so, they argued, and this was a UN report that was, uh, that was published in 2017, they said that fragmentation is the main element of that apartheid system and that the international community whether willingly or, unwill uh, or unwittingly even, has contributed to that fragmentation by continuing to divide Palestinians and to look at only one segment of the Palestinian people rather than looking at them as one collective who are facing the same apartheid regime. So I think that my message would then be we need to start rethinking the way we approach the situation in a way that doesn't fragment and that considers all Palestinians as being part of the solution. Thank you, um, Irania. So uh, we have many questions on actually actions by the international community or Palestinians to confront uh, the annexation uh, plan. And uh, there's a question from Tim about what uh, can ordinary people do uh, to pressure the international community to take a firmer stance on the issue of annexation beyond the ineffective method of writing letters to local political representatives. Uh, Yara, given your uh, big background in um, advocacy, uh, what do you think can Palestinians do more to pressure the international community? Um, I, I really honestly think that one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest tools that we have at our disposal is uh, the boycott, divestment, uh, and sanctions uh, movement. Um, uh, and with regards to uh, you know, third state actors, I think there has to be an incredible amount of pressure um, on them to to sanction Israel, and they have the mechanisms to do so, and there's precedents for sanctions. Um, Russia was sanctioned uh, when it annexed Crimea um, in the uh, not so distant past. I also think the other aspects of the BDS movement are equally as important, divestment, um, making sure that companies that are complicit in the um, Israeli uh, occupation and oppression uh, uh, of pa Palestine and Palestinians are held accountable um, because at the end of the the day, uh, living in a global capitalist society, we know that that money talks. And when we make it costly uh, for people to continue with the oppression of another people, then it becomes less attractive to do so. And I think also boycott is an incredibly important tool, and not just uh, the boycott of goods, but also the cultural and academic boycott. I think there has to be a price paid uh, for this continuous oppression, this continuous uh, settler colonial project and unfortunately the Palestinians don't have so many allies these days and I think it, and, and that's certainly true in terms of governments but I still think that we do have these old solidarity networks amongst the people uh, and the political situation in the world doesn't look so good there is a huge swing uh, to the right but but there is hope uh, and I think there is hope coming from all these different 
uh, protest movements against uh, structural racism around the world. And, and to be honest, I think it, I think it's very important in terms of dismantling uh, these these power structures that we also see in Palestine. So I would say uh, intersectional solidarity uh, and BDS are, are crucial in this fight against uh, the theft of Palestinian land. Thank you, uh, Yara. So we have a couple of questions that are um, similar. Um, uh, so there is a question by Bassam, which is linked to the question by John. So Bassam is asking, East Jerusalem has been annexed and settlement blocks have been annexed. So does protesting Jordan Valley annexation, uh, would it make any difference to protest it? And shouldn't we let Israel annex Area C and use it as a trigger to get us out of the Oslo trap? So this is linked to a question by John, who is asking whether a formal annexation would um, leave Israel naked before uh, the world, and thus it might be an, um, as an apartheid state, and so it might be a positive development for waking up the world to the urgent need for constructive action and change. Irania, what do you think about this um, different approach to annexation as a way to let us out of Oslo and just uh, showing the reality, uh, pressuring more the international community in a way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, l let's put it this way. It's not really our choice whether annexation happens or not. It is going to happen, and it's been a long-term plan. So this is something that is happening whether we like it or not. Um, right now, I think that you're right in saying that it is a wake-up call. Um, it's a late one, for sure, because it should have come ages, decades ago, um, um, if not at the very beginning. But uh, in any case, the point is that uh, this is something that doesn't change the reality, but as you say, that lifts this facade that for many years has made it look like um, look like uh, the situation is not one of apartheid, when in fact it is. So I think that um, we can have hope that there will be more pressure now and more recognition of the existence of apartheid, but we need to also emphasize and be clear that this is not something that is new or that it changes fundamentally the nature of the situation that Palestinians face. In fact, it only entrenches more of the same. Um, and so this also shows us that the positions of the international community have really been have not been genuine when it comes to Palestine, um, because saying now that they are concerned by the situation is um, is not very is, is not very credible when in fact for years this has been a reality that they have not been willing to address. Um, so I might what what we might say at least is that it does bring us closer to that realization that this already is an apartheid system. Um, and also the fact that annexation is coming will make that uh, even more crystal clear. And this recognition is growing within the UN and outside of the UN as we speak. Thank you, uh, Yara. Uh, Rania, sorry. Uh, Yara, there is a question from Johnny. Um, assuming legal annexation proceeds, would it make sense for the PA to relinquish its so-called control over the West Bank and hand all responsibility for day-to-day -day administration back to Israel as a way of making more apparent Israel's discriminatory policies? What do you think about this? I think that's a very good question. Um, uh, I also think it's a very difficult one to answer. I think... Uh, it's important to say that uh, Israel actually finds the PA very beneficial and it doesn't uh, want the responsibility of, uh, of the Palestinian populations in the West Bank. Actually, its, it's policy has always been as much land with as, lit as little pe people, on, as little Palestinians on it as possible. So I don't think that's, even if the PA were to pursue that, I don't think that the Israelis would accept that because it would, um, it would lead to a very existential question for them is in terms of citizenship and residency. Would they have to give these Palestinians uh, uh, um, any kind of uh, uh, formal Israeli identification? And if it did so, um, it would mean uh, an end to uh, Jewish majority because the Palestinians are um, higher uh, in number um, from the river uh, to the sea. Um, 
And of course, Israel uh, does not want that. It's an ethnocratic uh, state. Um, it wants to maintain a Jewish majority at all costs. So even if the PA were to pursue that as a strategy, I think that Israel would not accept that. Just as other settler colonial and colonial regimes have done so in the past, they have always recruited a native uh, uh, oppressing force to do their dirty work for them. And that's exactly what they've done in Palestine. And it's a system uh, and a uh, and a model that works very, very well, unfortunately. Uh, thank you, uh, Yara. Uh, we have many other questions, but unfortunately have to uh, bring this uh, to, uh, to an end. Um, thank you. If you want us to continue with the policy labs, uh, please donate uh, to Al Shabaka because the, uh, this is the only way uh, we actually can uh, uh, continue on doing this, uh, this job. Um, have a nice day or evening, depending on your time zone. Please keep safe, healthy, um, and well. Thank you, Irania and Yara. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Nuri. Bye. You've been listening to the Palestine Podcast, a production of the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign. For more podcasts like this, please visit www.ipsc.ie forward slash podcast. For more news, analysis, events, and ways in which you can take action, see our website at www.ipsc.ie. Thank you for listening, and you'll be hearing from us again soon.